Hey Rainier View, so good to be with you online. So I wanted to start today with a question for you all. So who is someone you know that makes the world better and why? I'll give you a moment to share your answer in the chat box and I'll be back with you in just a bit. There are so many people who I could name here, but one person I want to give a shout out to is Chatone Martin, who is a member here at Parkland Campus. Uh, Chatone is one of the founders of Lifting Spirits with Helping Hands, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to collecting and providing free medical equipment to those in need. If you've ever dealt with insurance, you know it doesn't always come through and it always isn't affordable and that's where people like Chatone and her team step in to make a difference. If you want to learn more about the amazing work she is doing, head to the link below. Uh, people like Chatone inspire us because they live in a way that causes goodness to flourish. And just imagine what could happen if we could all be like that. People whose lives make the world just a little bit better each and every day. But I don't want you to just imagine. I want you to consider that Jesus says we can be those kinds of people. And in fact, we are called to be those kinds of people. And so the big question is, how do we become those kinds of people? How do we get there? Well, Jesus gives us the answer in the Sermon on the Mount. But before we look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, to best understand what Jesus is saying here, it's important to remember that this sermon is found in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew wrote and organized his Gospel account to communicate a specific message that Jesus is the new and better Moses who is leading us into a new and better way of life. Uh, for those not familiar with Moses, he is considered one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament. And his story is told from Exodus through De Deuteronomy and can be really summed up in five parts. And here are the five. One, when he was born, an evil king tried to kill him. Two, Moses survives the attempt and is raised in Egypt. Three, Moses takes the Israelites through the Red Sea, freeing them from slavery under Egypt and giving them a new life. Four, Moses spends 40 years in the wilderness with his people, during which they are constantly tested and tempted. And five, at the end of these 40 years, Moses climbs a mountain and teaches a new generation of Israelites how God wants them to live in the new land he is giving them. Now, after hearing all that, you may be thinking, hey, that's really great information, but what exactly does Moses' life have to do with a sermon Jesus delivers nearly a thousand years later? And oh, by the way, what does that have to do with becoming people who make the world better? Well, I'm glad you asked all those questions, so take a look at this. Take a look at how Matthew tells Jesus' story. One, when Jesus was born, an evil king tries to kill him. Two, Jesus survives his attempt and is raised in Egypt. Three, Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River, which marks the beginning of his mission to free people from sin and death and welcome them to new life. Four, Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness, during which he is tested and tempted and he overcomes. So number five, are there any guesses what happens in Matthew 5? Go ahead and put it in the chat box. I'll wait. That's about five seconds. You might have typed it in by now. If you caught on to Matthew's pattern, then we should not be surprised that in chapter five, we find Jesus on a mountain teaching people how they are to live in the new world or AKA the kingdom that God is bringing. So the Sermon on the Mount then is Jesus's way of saying, hey, remember how before Israel entered the promised land, Moses taught them best practices for living to the fullest? Well, I'm about to do the same exact thing, except this time 
I'm preparing you for the future when God brings his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. If the theological language there is a little bit confusing, I want you to try to think about it this way. When you know you are going to have a child in a couple of months, uh, what do most people do? And I wouldn't know based on personal experience, but I read some articles. And what the articles say is they do everything they can to prepare for the new season of life that is coming. Uh, they get the nursery ready. They buy a crib, car seat, stroller, food, diapers. Uh, they ask friends to help via the registry. They read books on parenting. They take classes on parenting. They listen to podcasts on parenting. They figure out time off from work, uh, how they're going to re-enter into work, how their entire schedule and habits are going to be shaped and reoriented. Most people don't go, oh shoot, we're going to have a baby tomorrow. We didn't do anything. No, most parents, they anticipate how their lives are going to change and they start preparing for the future as if their lives are going to change. And likewise, Jesus is saying that one day God will make all things right and make all things new. And even though right now it seems like the only the rich and the powerful and the selfish are the ones who are blessed, it's not always going to be that way. Because when God brings heaven to earth, when God's kingdom is established and evil is no more, then it will be the poor and the weak and the heartbroken and the persecuted who will be the blessed ones because the arrival of God's kingdom will so drastically transform our world. And because that will happen according to Jesus, it should cause us to rethink our habits and priorities if we want to be ready for the world to come. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus invites us to become people today who can flourish in the kingdom that is coming tomorrow. So what do kingdom-ready people look like? Well, first Jesus says they look kind of salty. He says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown and trampled underfoot. So does anyone here like kimchi? I know that wasn't the question you were expecting after that passage, but just bear with me for a minute. Now, if you've ever made kimchi before or you have seen someone make it, you know that the professionals like my mother always use salt. And yes, it is a flavor thing because unsalted kimchi is gross and mushy, but it's more important than flavor and texture. Salt plays a critical role in the kimchi making process. It promotes the growth of lactic acid bacteria that creates an acidic environment that prohibits spoilage. This is why you can eat kimchi that you forgot about in your fridge back when FDR was president, but you toss out that bag of spinach you forgot about a week ago. Now, if you are living in the first century during Jesus' time and you don't have a fridge, how are you going to extend the shelf life of your food? Well, you would use salt. So put two and two together. What is Jesus saying? Well, he's saying when salt functions as it should, it fosters what is good, that lactic acid bacteria, and it inhibits what is bad. Likewise, kingdom people who live as they should bring forth goodness and create a culture that is inhospitable to decay. And you don't need me to tell you that there is a lot of decay in our world. You see it everywhere and you can't avoid it because as Sherwin Patton once put it, people always are peopling. People are difficult. They are messy. They are selfish. And guess what? You and I are people who are peopling too. And whenever we lie, discourage, gossip, exclude, or seek to get even or ahead, we're not just failing to love people as ourselves. We're contributing to the decay, brokenness, and darkness in this world. But here's the good news. We don't have to remain a part of the problem. There is an alternative way to live just as salt preserve and brings out the best in food. We can preserve and bring out the best in our world and the best in our neighbors. And yes, even bring out the best in our enemies. And the way we do this is by living out the values of God's coming kingdom. And when we act like salt, we will also inevitably become like light. That's why Jesus adds this in his Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill 
cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If that connection Jesus draws between salt and light really isn't connecting in your mind, here's one helpful way to picture it. So I want you to look at this real quick. I have here uh, a bunch of delicious, red delicious apples. They've been sitting around for who knows how long and honestly, you know the name doesn't work because red delicious aren't known for their taste anyways. But here's the thing, you don't get an option, you have to eat one of these apples. These are the only apples that exist in the entire world, so go ahead and choose a red delicious apple. Now you might be thinking, oh that's fine, red delicious, we'll bear with it, whatever, it's okay. But what if you were presented with a different option? What if Crystal threw me, ooh, I caught it, a Fuji apple, that was one take by the way. What if she had a Fuji apple and she grew it in her garden and she washed it in her kitchen and they were perfectly ripe? Well, obviously she got this from Target, but what if she did that? If you had the option, you would undoubtedly go with Crystal's apple. Why? Because there's a difference between her and me. It's like night and day. What I have to offer is really bland and unappealing and bitter and not so great for cooking, but what Crystal has to offer is sweet and nutritious. And once you add cinnamon and butter and some gluten-free flour, it can bless your local pastor. Just like you would choose Crystal's apples over my lackluster ones, people around us are looking for something good, something pure and something that will nourish their souls. But all too often, their only option seems to be the equivalent of these uninspiring red delicious apples. And so the only thing they know how to do is to settle for what's available on hand or, or, or to give it to someone else and to leave, it, uh, leave them unsatisfied too. But what if someone gave them another option? What if instead of judgment, they were offered the fruit of peace? Uh, what if instead of exclusion, they were offered the fruit of hospitality? What if instead of hate and anger and bitterness and selfishness, they got a taste of love and joy and forgiveness and generosity? If that were the case, suddenly whoever is handing out the good fruit would stand out, right? Just as the Fuji apple is standing out from the red delicious, they would stand out in the world. One could say it would be as unignorable as a city on a hill or a light that shines in the darkness. In the same way, Jesus is saying, kingdom people, when you get salty, when you cultivate and give out what is good, then people are going to see that there can be an alternative to darkness. There's a better way to live and to be in this world. And once they have tasted it and seen that mercy and grace and love is far better than what this world has to offer, perhaps they will want to be salty people too and give glory to the God who is bringing a better world and a better kingdom. And here's the exciting part and kind of the scary part. If Jesus is serious about us, that those who follow him and who are about to inherit his kingdom are salt and light and Fuji apples, then we are called to be in the business of goodness. But what does this goodness look like in our everyday lives? So over the next two months, we are going to unpack this together. We will explore what Jesus has to say about becoming kingdom people and their approach to various aspects of life. Because this world has a lot to say about anger and enemies and sex and judgment and money and worries. And so often what it has to teach us and the people around us, it leaves us feeling empty and disgusted and broken and longing for more. And this is why the Sermon on the Mount is good news for us today. Because here Jesus offers a better way to deal with our anger, a better way to relate to our enemies, a better way to think about sex, judgment, money, and worries. And if we take seriously and embody the different kind of life Jesus calls us to, we will not only be kingdom-ready people, but we will also draw others into this new, beautiful, and goodness-drenched way of being human. So there's three things I want to invite you to to the summer as we go through this series of what if Jesus was serious. Number one, 
I want to encourage you to come to church this summer. Uh, whether you join us in person or online, make it a priority to be here at RVCC. If you haven't visited in a while, now is a great time to reconnect, engage with us, participate, stay connected, and let's learn how to be kingdom ready together. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is to meditate on this memory verse. It comes from Matthew 7, 24 to 25. It's the end on the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. As we go throughout this series, let this verse remind you to build your life on the solemn foundations of Jesus' teachings here. And then the last thing I want to encourage you to do is to be open to trying goodness. What Jesus has to say won't always be easy or comfortable, but I want to challenge you to give goodness a try. Because goodness isn't just good for you, it, it transforms those around you and blesses the world we share together. So pray for openness and for the courage to take Jesus seriously this summer.